Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode. We're going to be talking about the value of subject matter experts. And to have that, we have Mr. Jake Hall, who is, you may know him as the manufacturing millennial by night. And at daytime, he's a business development manager at FZ. So welcome, Jake. Chris, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, man, I'm excited to have you, my friend. I'm very excited to have you. So maybe get a start to explain to our listeners out there in, in, in uh, podcast land, you know, what you're talking about when, you, when, when you're saying subject matter experts. Absolutely. So when we look at subject matter experts, especially in the field of manufacturing, it's kind of broken down in a few ways. There's always the, the sales side out there where people go out and they try to sell their products. And there's the engineering side, which is the people who are developing it. But when I view as a subject matter expert, it's a person that a company can leverage if they're in manufacturing or they're selling a product or they're a distributor where they can really focus on a person who's knowledgeable around a product line, rather it be PLCs, drives, vision systems, AGVs, robotics, the automation world, but it's someone who can communicate on a high level, but be able to bring it in a way that any user or end user can understand what the capabilities are. So when I look at a subject matter expert, it's not just someone who can retain and blurt out a bunch of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's great, but it's someone who can really communicate it to any level of person who's been in the industry for 10 years or someone who's just starting out. Right, right. No doubt, no doubt, for sure. Now, how about things have been changing a lot from an SME standpoint? You know, how do you feel the importance of that SME has really shifted recently? Oh, man, it's crazy. When we look at the world of we're going to call the post-pandemic, I think, I think things have changed significantly where for a long time, sales was done on a handshake face-to-face -face basis. And that's going to come back. Things are opening up. The CDC just made some announcements yesterday. But what I see happening in the future is having a, a digital social you know, uh, expert in the way that he could be a person that talks about um, their product or does short videos or product highlights that is something a little bit more than just reading a data sheet. It's someone who has the ability to talk about real world applications and how he's using the solutions that those products provide to solve problems. Okay. Now, you know, when you say from a digital standpoint, so you're talking about creating videos and content and things like that that speak specific to the problems themselves, not necessarily the product, but how those that product can solve those issues. Absolutely. Everyone can talk about a product, but not everyone can talk about a problem. And I think that's really what subject matter experts bring to the table is it's not just someone who's knowledgeable to drive and can tell you all the statistics and features about it, but it's someone who can really say what advantages do I use this drive in a scenario versus a different brand or a different drive? That's where a subject matter expert adds value beyond just the product, but the problems that they're solving with that product in the industry. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I even saw something the other day, Jake, that I wanted to share with you. It was about, it was from a marketing firm and they were, they were talking to engineers. They, they, they polled, I think 1300 engineers mm -hmm. and it seems to the, the data that's coming back is earlier and earlier in the buying cycle, engineers are looking for data from SMEs. And I just thought that was interesting that if you want to really help engineers these days, you need to be, have that social presence and be in front of them on the stuff they're searching about. And they're searching about how to solve problems. Like you said. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the world's different now than it was 10 years ago. When you look at a sales engineer, before you needed someone to go out, and this is just an example, you needed someone to go out there and explain how a retroreflective photo light works. That's common knowledge now. That's that stuff that, and at least in my experience, has moved away from the control side. And that's just stuff that's having them on the mechanical side now for specking out sensors and drives and PLCs. It's no longer in the controls world. And I believe the reason that's the case is because of the value and the, the mass amount of information that's online that designers can just look up. Right. So that's how we need to continue to separate and differentiate ourselves in the subject matter expert world is that that per, that designer is not coming to you anymore to say, hey, 
these are the you know inputs that I have, or these are the outputs that I need. What do you recommend? They can do those with calculations online. What they need to say is, hey, I'm in this environment. This is the situation I'm facing. Where do I start? What sections or categories should I look at? Mm-hmm. That's what we're seeing differently. Yeah. I mean, it's really that shift. I, I love how you said that from that traditional, just the, 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 pe- the parts and pieces expert to really understanding process and what the, what the end user is trying to accomplish from the SME standpoint. That's where the value is, is coming in now. Yeah, absolutely. Right before, you know, years ago, this was about eight years ago when I was first starting out in sales, my first job out of college was in distribution. And it would say, hey, you want the latest, you know, catalog book and here you go. If you have any questions, ring me up, you know, but things have changed and evolved since then where no one wants a physical one and a half inch catalog anymore. You know, I I walk, you know, the story, Chris, you used to walk into mechanical designers desks and they literally had a cabinet and a wall shelf of every single product line that's out there that they would have to go in and reference. Now you walk into a shelf and they have a bunch of, you know, Legos or minifigures up there, right? Because they don't need those catalogs anymore because they can just do a Google search and all that information is readily available. You get that right. I, I always thought it was fascinating. Whenever I walk into ENI planner's office and they'd have the, the industrial control catalogs from the, from like every year it came out, like it's a, yep. uh, uh, you know, a massive collection of encyclopedias or something. I'm like, look, you know, that stuff's, you know, it, it doesn't change that much. Well, yeah, but I may need something from the version two. Like, <laughs> hey, man, I'll, just be you, you know? <laughs> I, I remember I remember that. That was just a routine. When you go up there, you get the new, you know, catalog for like banner engineering or something, and you walk up to the shelf and say, well, pull this one off. This one's old. Yeah, you know, put your new one up and say, there you go. Right. You know, and that's just... And that's just not the case anymore for for when it comes to helping with, you know, engineers and design work. No doubt. No doubt, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now, Jake, we hear a lot of time talking about when we talk to industrials and manufacturers about the workforce attrition, things that are happening. It's, it's tough to find people and to get these jobs. So curious on what you're seeing to tie it all together. Do you have any examples where you see people embracing SMEs to cover some of these skills gaps that they're losing? Absolutely. Well, one thing, I'm going to take it from a little bit different approach, Chris. One thing I see companies doing more is leveraging subject matter experts to attract new talent to their company, right? Right. If someone can go out there and a person who's very knowledgeable about, about the industry that they're in, and they can talk about what exciting things are happening out there and why there's, you know, new technology and ingenuity involved within their field, they're leveraging subject matter experts to attract the new generations to say, hey, this is what we're a part of. Because that subject matter expert really understands what's being involved with the industry. So, I mean, that's one way I'm seeing leveraging. But the other way I'm seeing within the, the, the job shortage right now and the skill gaps is just subject matter experts can go online and be a social media presence to hundreds, if not thousands of people by a 60 second clip. You cannot have that reach doing door-to-door operations. Mm -hmm. So you also need to be more strategically, you know, time aware with with your own employees on saying, hey, how can I use a social media reach to get content out there rather than a door-to-door? Right. Now, are you seeing that more on an individual basis or do you see like companies embracing that? Where, Where do you see that working the best? You know, I see more individuals taking that initial leap and companies afterwards are seeing that value yeah. of saying, wow, there's conversations that come from this. I mean, Chris, you, you, you and I could even go back to that point where you and I were having a completely unrelated discussion. We were talking about the podcast and upcoming recording this. And then we talked about our companies and said, well, hey, wait a second. FZ and Eco, there's some opportunity here within our, you know, our southern branches and where you guys are located. Right. That is where companies are beginning to see value saying, wow a relationship curated from something not directly related to selling the company product or the company solution. That's where that value is seeing. And you see more and more companies between manufacturers, but also integrators and distributors mm-hmm. leveraging that. You know, and we, and we know distributors listen to us too. I mean, we're trying to help 
the, the industry as a whole. I mean, we've had some distributor, some, some competitive distributor feedback as well, and it's been very positive. And I'm just curious on your take, you know, for business models like us, you know, we're supporting industry, we're supporting integrators like yourself, as well as the manufacturers directly, you know, what should, what should we start doing or, or, or how should we change to be relevant as to where engineers and, and decision makers are moving in the future? Yeah, I would say you need to strategize your employees on the idea they need to stop selling and start solving problems. So stop selling, start solving. And solving is a path that leads to selling. But what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to understand that customer Mm -hmm. and the customer's needs a lot more. And I think that's what... It relates right back to a subject matter expert. You're talking about industry problems, not about a product. And companies will then reach out to you more to say, wow, this person's knowledgeable in the industry and not just something that's on his line card. What do you think's the hurdle there? I mean, is that just a mental shift because we just want to naturally sell? Yeah, I think I think it's the idea of for so long, um, companies had this idea of this funnel feed, right? You need to get in front of your customers. You need to tell them you need to hand, you know, this many product sheets and flyers off and data sheets to this customer because they're going to buy it more often then. And I'm not disagreeing with the funnel thing. The, the funnel the funnel feed is still something out there that works. And I, I believe it does. But at the same time, you need to take a different approach where it's not just a numbers game, but it's a relationship and it's a solution providing game. Right. No doubt. No doubt, man. So, I mean, to speak to the SMEs out there that, that, we're, that we're trying to groom, man, where do we find them? And then how do we keep them or how do we build them up? It's interesting right now. There's always the, dis- the discussion about employee, re- you know, attraction, but there's never the discussion about employee retention, I think, nearly as often. Right. And companies need to say, where, where do I have internally areas that I can leverage my employees to be a larger social media presence. And I'll do a plug, you know, with the whole manufacturer millennial thing. I think millennials and companies have a great opportunity to be subject matter experts and be a voice or image for that company to create content and conversation. Millennials, I would say, are a lot more likely to get in front of a camera, to be posting on social media, to understand the conversation, to almost understand the memes and the relevant, you know, ideas out there and communicate to that. You look at the marketing campaigns that other companies are doing in the consumer space or the food space, you know, Wendy's and Arby's and all these other places have these Twitter accounts that go viral all the time, right? Because they have a person who's shouting memes and is relevant to the, you know, current online trends, but they're literally getting hundreds of thousands of likes of views every day because a person's making a funny, relevant comment online. That's just the way the industry is now. And you look at, you know, with me on LinkedIn, pushing the subject matter expert from the manufacturing millennial side, it's I'm able to go out there and take the content from different manufacturers and be able to share that and show, listen, we can create a lot of awareness around the industry without trying to, you know, shove a product down a person's throat. Right. And I think that's where people are a lot more receptive to, change and looking at things when they don't feel like they're being sold something it's just they're 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 learning something yeah well i can tell you one thing just from to to keep on plugging your the manufacturing millennial i learn a lot you you put just so much good information out there your videos just the way that you're creating awareness about manufacturing in general uh it's amazing so hats off to you we love what you're doing appreciate it thanks and it's been a lot of fun it's been a lot of fun doing it The, the relationships of the friendships that are curated just by having conversations, it's incredible. It's got to be. I mean, I can only imagine it's so much fun and created so many opportunities for you, you know, and, it, and I think it's just showing a new model for, from a BDM standpoint in particular. I mean, it, it's so much uh, upside, but you it also for the people that out there to think too, well, I'll just start a podcast or I'll just start something like the Manufacturing Millennial. There's a lot of work. It, it takes a lot of intentionality to go behind making something like that successful. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing, you know, is I encourage people to go out there, go out there, start your own personal brand, create conversation. But one thing I think people need to realize is 
there's more engagement that needs to happen on your end up front before people are just going to start coming to your page because people are like, Hey, Jake, I post videos every, you know, twice a week for a month and really nothing ever happened. But I said, that's great though. But how often are you engaging in the people who comment on your videos? How often are you going out to other people's content and engaging with that? So people follow you back to your page. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a continued investment and it's, it's, I mean, it's just the, the matter of sales in that case, you got to do your reach. You do, you do. Now, how about advice, Jake? I'm, I'm, I can't wait to hear what you would offer up here. So for people out there that are listening, you know, the next generation, we're trying to build SMEs. You know, maybe they're trying to figure out where to specialize or, or how to get started. What would you offer up? Oh, man. So someone who was brand new to the industry? Sure. Or, or are you talking about like high school going in? Where Give me give me your, where, where are you thinking within the, that range? I w- I'd like to, to maybe hear both ends. So like to a high school going in, but also some, maybe someone who, who is just new to industry in general. But, but talk, talk to both ends of it because there may be different points of advice that you would offer for both. Yeah. I mean, so the one thing that I will push right away is, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll speak to the adults or the kids who are, who are listening to these podcasts as well, is you do not need a four-year degree anymore to be successful. And, and I'm going to leverage that in a way where I am truly passionate about the two-year associate's degrees and skilled trades that are available, programs that are available now for, you know, young, you know, upcoming professionals and, and, and people in the industry, you can go out and you can get a welding degree, a plumbing degree, an electrician degree, you know, learn how to program a CNC or a robotic, you know, mechatronics degree, graduate pretty much debt free from that college. And you are in already super high demand for the industry. I think for so long, um, society pushed that you need to go get a four year degree to be successful or to be competitive in the industry. And I think over the past 10, 15 years, we found out that was flawed, especially with the trillions of dollars that students debts that out there that, that, you know, that students have with debt. And the fact that now they have so much debt, they can't go out and buy a house. Mm -hmm. They can't go out and and, and continue to contribute to the economy because now they're just paying off that, that bank for so long. So I look at, you know, young kids, four year degrees are not the only option that's out there. And parents who are listening to this, Look, talk to your kid. They, there's nothing wrong with not going to get a four-year degree. Skilled trades are very respected right now in the industry, and they're going to continue to be respected in the industry. You know, and then so so that's what I'm saying. The people who are entering the workforce, the people who are currently in the workforce. You know, I would say every person has something they can teach someone else. And I I think people say they need to have years and years and years of experience before they view themselves as an expert. But going out and asking questions to experts is a great value as well. And that's the whole entire thing for me as well is I share a lot of content on LinkedIn around manufacturing processes. Does that mean I know every single thing about them? Absolutely not. But what it's allowing me to do is allow me to curate conversation with other people. So when those questions come up or those questions around those industries, I have that network and that reach to make that happen. Right. And you can, you can connect those dots for people and really and bring them together. Absolutely. You know, so people who are in the industry, you know, you don't let the quote unquote idea of a subject matter expert be a limitation. If you're saying, I haven't been in this industry for 15 years, you could be an expert on connections. You're right. You could be an expert of someone who just simply knows a lot of people because you've been curating content and asking questions and going to events and listening to webinars. And, you know, you listen to, to the eco podcast, or you're listening to, you know, the manufacturing happy hour with Chris Lukey, one of my, you know, one of my good friends, you know, those are the type of things where you can gain a lot of knowledge just by being active in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't give away my secret sauce there, Jake. That's, that's, that's my sauce, man. (laughs) (laughs) This is good stuff, man. Good stuff. Love this conversation, Jake. And we always wrap it up the, the, the eco ass why with the why. You know, so if if you had to put the why around why you feel so strongly about the SMEs uh moving forward in the future, what would that why be? I think it goes back to my the earlier comment I said. It's the idea of stop trying to sell products, start solving problems in the industry. 
And I, I think if people can walk away with that at the end of this podcast, I think it's really going to change how you approach your business. Stop selling the product or the solution you have and start trying to communicate the problems in the industry and you'll find value in return then. No doubt. No doubt. Jake, this has been wonderful for our listeners. Check out the show notes. You'll have an easy way. If you're not already connected with Jake, uh, shame on you. Get connected with him. He's dropping just wonderful information all the time. So that would be great ways for them to connect directly with you, Jake, and I'm sure you can help uh, inspire even more. So thank you so much for walking this, uh, this topic out with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.